Righto. So um, that was um, that's the background for tonight. Uh, we spoke with Fork Tongue. Um, three three people are going to have uh, PowerPoint presentations. So uh, told a little white lie there. Righto. So tonight uh, we've got myself um, talking about Trove, using Trove, which is the National um, Library of Australia um, repository for uh, uh, newspapers um, talk a bit about that about aviation research and have a little bit of a look a little bit of a play with some artificial intelligence then we've got uh, Ian Campbell who's uh, logged on at the moment to give us an update on his research on his next book about Don Bennett Mary Van Hummel will uh, talk about uh, Herman Evert Van Hummel uh, Netherlands East Indies Air Force flight engineer during World War II Bo Uncle Bob's going to talk about a single engine Lodestar that he um, travelled between here and New Zealand in. And Warwick's going to talk about um, his experience uh, flying a dove with uh, no brakes and no steering. So what I'm going to talk about is Trove. So to find Trove, I don't know how computer literate all you people are. Some of you are probably much more expert than I, but so you could type Trove up here, up the top, or you could try, type it in here. I'll type it in here and we'll find the web page. So there's the web page. Um, I'll click I'll click on this one here, Trove. And um, probably should have clicked on the other one. Click on this one. <clears throat> okay, so that's the where you where you do your searches for um uh what are you looking for basically it, it's very interesting i mean you type your own name in and you might find some of your um early childhood uh, mentions in the local newspaper depending on how small the newspaper was because i must have a look I, I was on the front page of the telly when i was young i think Telegraph. i think i found myself in the townsville paper a couple of times archfield so what i'm going to do is do a search for archfield airport um so I've typed in Archfield Airport. I'll click the little thing button there. So it's found 2,891 res results, okay? However, what that's found is pages that have got the word Archfield, pages that have got the word airport, and maybe the word Archfield. What I'm really after is the two words together in a phrase. So what you do is you put them in inside inverted commas. So if you watch that, it's 2891, the first go I had a look for Archfield Airport. Now it's 365. So it's now finding real events, um, real newspaper articles uh, and advertisements, et cetera, uh, involving Archfield Airport. Now if you look over on the right here, um, you can see that there are ways of limiting um, that search result. So you know what you're looking for, you know where it might be. And it's probably an event that happened in Queensland. So if you click on the Queensland link, it'll just list all the newspapers that are in Queensland. Um, if you know it was in Brisbane, you might maybe click on the Courier Mail to limit the number of search. So it's brought, brought it down to 43 results. Um, so there's ways of narrowing down and honing in to find the target result. You can also, if you go down here, click on, so if you're looking for something in World War II, like I usually am, you'd click on that that one there and that would limit it down to 90 results for Archfield Airport. Um, I'll just unclick that. Um, so there are a ways of limiting what the results might be to get you closer to what you're actually looking for. And it's, you know, I mean, you can limit it to articles only. You'll find that there are advertising things in here. So you, you might want to click on that articles to get rid of all these gazettes and all these other things. So just keep that in mind. Now, you probably think you've found everything now um, about Archfield Airport, but hang on. Um, can't you also call this an aerodrome? A E R O D R O M E. So it's going from 365 results. There's another 8,000 results because I've now renamed it. So 
you choosing your search terms is very important. Um, what else could you call it? You could call it an air drone. <laughs> okay. There's no, another. you couldn't. <laughs> well, people have, obviously. Yes, I know. Because there's, there's, there's five results there. Okay. Um, Peter, yeah. could you try it? Could you try Archer's Field? Yeah, I'm going to do that. Archer's Field. <laughs> well, that's what the Yanks called it. Um, well, some people even call it a drone, Archfield drone. 507 results. Look at that. Wow. So you've really got to think about what keywords you use for your search. Now, I think it was Alan that mentioned Archer's Field. Um, A-R-C-H. That's what the Yanks called it quite often during World War II. Um, it's actually found something with club in between. Um, doesn't you now here's one here. <laughs> Archer's Field. <laughs> it's a different thing in South Australia. So nothing to do with our Archfield. So it look it doesn't appear to have found anything of interest. Mrs. Archer Field. Mrs. <laughs> Ethel Archer Field. Um, okay, so that's um, so that's something to remember. Uh, the, the inverted commas and choosing the right keyword searches. Let's try something different. Let's try, let's type in the name of our organization, Aviation Historical Society of Australia. Hey, look at that, 11 results. You can also um, put these in order of the earliest first or the latest date first. So I'll put earliest first. So let's, um, earliest first, yeah. So let's have a look at a few of these. Um, so here's an article in RAF News, probably um, digitized by our historical people that are online tonight. Um, so if we go down, here's an article in the RAF News, 1st of January, 1961, Sunday, they work on a Sunday. The Secretary of the Aviation Historical Society of Australia, blah, blah, blah. And it's Mr. Bowden. I don't know, does anyone remember him at all? From oh East yes, Trevor Borton. Trevor Broughton is dead now, but yes, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's an article that he put in um, the RAF News, looking for some information, um, something to do with the Messerschmitt Me two six two. An associate of a society is preparing a book, any material received, blah blah blah. So, so there's one article. Um, well, you got? Let's go to another one. So this is one here. Uh, again in RAF News, Monday this time, 1st of January, 62. Um, I think it's, um, where are we? Uh, it's Trevor again. Yeah, Trevor again, up the top here. The Honorary Secretary. So he was the Secretary. He lived at East Bentley where my daughter lives. Um, okay, so there was an article there. But we won't sort of read it all. Um, a message from Malta. Okay, this is RAF News again. Correspondent in Malta is trying to find contact with Australian airmen who served there in World War II. That's Trevor again. Okay. Um, so another article. And if we just work our way down. So this is an advert. Even though it's an advert, I'll have a look at it. Uh, see if I can just find the right F S O C C I T Y. Uh, there it is there. There it is there. So this is an article um, in the Papua New Guinea Post Courier, Port Moresby, on the Friday the 20th of February 1970. And it's an ad um, by the AHSA looking for members or people to receive the journal of the AHSA by the group in Sydney. <laughs> Who would, who would have expected to see that in the Port Moresby newspaper? So let's go down. Uh, where'd we get to? Righto, 17 Canberra Jets. So this is an interesting one. So the, the RAF had 17 Canberra Jets that were surplus and they, they were sold for a total of $46,475. And if you look at the list of people or groups that bought them, you can see the AHSA of Upper Mount Cravat. 
and a number of you know the history of that. And that Canberra jet used to be parked about 200 metres from my place here at Currabee uh, on Beanley Road um, near Pioneer Valley Park. But it's interesting to look at all the other groups that um, were promised a um, one of these aircraft as well. There's a group at Tugan, Townsville Aero Museum. I don't know, that might have been Sid Beck, um, Jeff, perhaps? Of yes, it could be. Of Mundingborough, uh, Sid Beck Museum, which eventually moved to Mariba, one in Western Australia, Parafield, South Australia. So they went all, all over the place. So that's that article. Um, another one to do with a meteor. Um, the Queensland branch of the AHSA were going to get Meteor WD647 for display at their newly established museum at Currabee, just up the road from my place. Um, so there's another article. And where I am. So that's that one. Um, it's an article here on Frigate Bird. Um, and at the end, it talks about the Aviation Historical Society wanted Frigate Bird, but the snag of shipping it back across the Pacific beat them. So I don't know which group, but might have been the Queensland group. Does anyone know? Yes, it was the King of QAM group right. went over there to. Yep. Save it from being bulldozed off a runway, off an airport, I should say, and eventually it ended up uh, being taken to France and it's on display in France. Right. Okay. Uh, so that's another article, and we'll just have a look at a couple more. Um, the Companies Act. Um, so here's a notice in um, July 1980 that the, after three months, the following companies will be um, struck off the register. And AHSA uh, is one of those companies. Aviation Historical Society of Australia Limited was going to be struck off the register if there was no explanation given within three months. Um, and then if I look at the next article, you can see where it was then struck off the register in June 1981. Um, it was a bit more than three months. But AHSA, again, I don't know the history of what, what happened there. Um, Warwick might know or okay. not. The Melbourne well, base, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I think there might be one more that I might show you was this one here. Uh, so this is something to do with the Royal Australian Navy uh, and the Journal of the Aviation Historical Society of Australia included a comprehensive historical article on the Royal Australian Navy aircraft. Anyway, just thought I'd show those just to show you what, what sort of things that you can find um, on, um, on Trove. Um, right, so I'll go back to um, Mr. Google now um, and I'll type in, I guess you've probably heard a lot of discussion in recent times about artificial intelligence and there's one particular um, service called uh, ChatGPT, C-H-A-T-G-P-T. So I'll just type that into Mr. Google. And um, I'll see if I can open the right page. I think it's that one. Is that the one? No, that's not the one. I thought I might use it in my, uh, it can write all my uh, uh, UBBPTs from now on. Yeah, well, you'd be surprised actually. So this is the page you need to find. Um, I'll click on try chat GPT. You can log in with your Google account or start an account. It, it's free at the moment. It's pretty clever. Uh, it can make mistakes. Um, and people do use it to write books and all sorts of things. 
So if I type in, I've just copied and paste, it saved me having to type it out. If I just type this in, tell me about Garbutt Airfield and, and I'll hit return. <laughs> so I'm not typing this, this is this service online. Um, so it's come up with this story, as you saw, pretty much straight away. Um, now, I don't, I, I'm not going to read it all. Uh, I did read a few of them that were, um, I don't think that's true, um, this bit here, um, because it's in the suburb of Garbutt, which was named after Mr. Garbutt, who had an abattoir, I think it was, Jeff, out that way. So I don't yeah. think that, don't think that bit's true. But um, it, it, it's, <laughs> Probably ninety percent really good. <laughs> you, you can. This is Daryl. You can actually tell it that that's not true and try again. Oh, can you? Right. Yeah. yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can have a conversation with it. Yeah, you can. Uh, yes, I've done that actually. Um, but I won't do that now. So I'll just type in another one, just to give you a few demos. So tell me about the CAC Mustang. Um, <clears throat> oh, here we go. It's already there. Um, I should have scrolled down earlier. So it's come up with that pretty much instantaneously. Um, if I say, tell me about a tiger moth. Um, huh. People use it to write ebooks. Scripts. There's Bill Capital uh, to have them, the small d, good on. Um, <laughs> and they've got gypsy spelled properly to GIPSY. Here we go. It always, it always seems to end with that's a summary paragraph. Yeah. Uh, so it, it 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 has writing skills. You can ask it. You can say, uh, "Tell me more" or something like that to you know to make out that that's not long enough, and it'll it'll go back and write some more. I think if you scroll down, there's a click box for that or something. Is there? So here, here's something else I've just typed in. Tell me about the Aviation Historical Society of Australia. Thanks. Okay. Um, wow. What do you reckon? Nine out of ten. Pretty good. Okay. I'll. There's a hypothetical one here. Write me a business plan for the <laughs> aviation aviation historical society of Australia. <laughs> Holy shit, that's excellent. We oh, could have done with this, Bob. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> um, was has a, anyone um, got, got something they'd like me to try and write in? I, I did one uh, called... Um, Asked it, uh, what is, who were the frozen chosen? <laughs> who were the frozen chosen? Well, chosen? Yeah, that was a nickname used in Korea. Ah. But it it came up with a very American answer. First Marine Division. Yeah, American answer. Chosen. It wasn't. It wasn't wrong, but from that, believe it or not, because it's talking about an article written by a. It, oh well, my version talked about an article written in a in the New York Times or something. So I went and typed in "frozen chosen" into Trove, and uh, found a whole another aspect of what the story means uh, in relation to Australia. Basically, that battle they're talking there about the Battle of Chosen Reservoir, seventy seven squadron was. Uh, fighting up there in the northeast of Korea at the time and were instrumental in the uh, in that battle in, in terms of attacking uh, the Chinese ground forces. Yep. So here we go. Yeah. Let's see what it comes up with you on you, John. Is that, that was about, when you say 77 squadron, that was Meteor era? No, that was uh, Mustangs. Uh, Mustangs. Mustangs. That was crucial role in development of the Air Force. Were well, you born on the 10th of November, 90, 1898? <laughs> wow, John. Wow. I can, can, can confirm that. Holiday's age well. 
<laughs> you were in World War II. <laughs> Play nicely. That's a typo. Ah, well, that's well, air commanding well, two group. Think. I don't think that's right. It must be a different bloke. Ah, yeah. <clears throat> anyway. Better put um, in the John Meyer the second. <laughs> yeah, I uh, didn't realise there was two of us. I think one's enough of the planet. <laughs> <laughs> well, one at a time, yeah. Oh, back in your box, Darren. You'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that, so, Peter, before we leave that, what was that? Uh, G, uh, chat GT or something was it? Chat GPT. GPT. G. Chat G for go good. P for Peter. T for Tom. That's uh, quite frightening from a from a um, plagiarism point of view. I was a tutor yeah. and lecturer at Griffith Uni, and when you look at that marketing plan, for example, you could easily pick um, plagiarism in the past, but that's going to make it a whole new ball game. Yeah, the, oh, um, oh, my son works in IT. He's a software engineer, and he and his mate, when they first found out about it, tested it by saying, "Write me a program in this code to do X, Y, Z." And it was something my son was working on at the time, and he just finished it. And the thing thing wrote computer code that did yep. what they asked it to do. You can write. You can uh, do web pages. Write code for web pages yep. using it. You can do formulas for spreadsheets um you can do almost anything yeah. um there was an article sorry a story on the news tonight about this very thing chat chat gpt and um that they were saying that very thing they were worried about students using in a university and there's another program i'm trying to think of the name of it and it was um something like like link it in or train it in or something like that. And LinkedIn. it actually goes, no, not LinkedIn. Um, but anyway, it goes through and checks the output of chat GPT and tells you where it's plagiarized. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there are. Yeah, so, there, are, there are. Interesting. Right. AI against AI. Yes. Yes. There, there, are, other, there are other companies developing uh, chat GPT type uh programs yeah i think Microsoft, i think google microsoft or google i think it's microsoft yeah microsoft edge has ai in it now it came in about a week ago mm. and the other mm. thing with, with chat gpt i put in a note tell me what to do for a 90 year old's birthday party and i got 12 dots and we only use one of them <laughs> we invited the family around for my wife's 90th birthday. <laughs> okay. Great um, idea. Let's move on. Um, our next speaker is Ian Campbell. So I'll throw the floor over to you, Ian. So can everybody hear me from here? Yep. yep. Yes. Hello yep. from hello from Redcliffe. And uh, uh, very happy to be uh, part of the evening. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as a result of my first book, thinks he's a bird, which I spoke to some of you about um, last year. I got involved at the Queensland Air Museum and now for my sins, I'm officially the curator of the Bennett Vile Archive. <clears throat> and this is uh, three collections, which I am currently cataloging. There are Don Bennett's personal papers and memorabilia from Deepwood House in Buckinghamshire, which was uh, his and Lee's home for many years. Uh, there's the collection of Alan Vile, who many of you would know, who was the late president of the Pathfinder Association of Queensland. And he's got two components to his collection. It's, he's got his own personal papers and memorabilia. And then he himself developed, uh, due to his personal friendship with Don Bennett, uh, his own personal Don Bennett collection. And then also is this third part of the archive, which is the official papers of the Pathfinder Association in Queensland. And so, as you might imagine, uh, as Alan Vile never threw anything out, is that it's a massive collection. There's thousands of pages and hundreds of photographs and there's books and there's booklets and there's memorabilia. And when I first came across it uh, back in 2019, uh, it was all in boxes. Uh, boxes and five rusty filing cabinets. And uh, I had asked who was working on the material and uh, Richard Clarkson, whom some of you may know, said nobody. So I stuck my hand up. 
And so I've been at it since August 2020. And the reason that I decided to do a biography of him is that all previous biographies were written by non-Australians. And uh, most of them have significant errors in them or try to paint Don Bennett in a particular way, either in a very sycophantic fashion or in terms of just sort of stereotyping or typecasting. And I thought, well, it's not really doing the guy an awful lot of good. So uh, I've been at it for uh, two and a half years now. And it's posed some very challenging questions. And I just wanted to raise those with you tonight, uh, just to let you know, and just give you a couple of examples. And one of the things that occurred to me early on is how do people decide what to keep about their lives? So what paperwork do they keep? What memorabilia do they keep, et cetera, as a mark of their lives? And how can we deduce from what they leave behind as to what was important to them. So I put the question to you as if people came to your place and they went through your filing cabinets and drawers and they looked at the directories on your computer and they perused the items on your shelves, would they get an accurate picture of what you found to be important in your life? And I've wrestled with this question as I've been working on the Don Bennett collection, because if you're writing somebody's biography, I think you don't just need to know what you think is important about them, but what they thought was important. And really a good biography will get inside the subject's head so that readers can see their world as they saw it. So I guess uh, at the end of tonight, I would invite you to go off and have a look around the room that you're sitting in or whatever, and have a look at uh, what you have collected and what's there and whether you think that actually represent <laughs> what you think is important to you. And you might be there. I'm looking at Robert, looking at the sky and thinking he might be there for the next 20 years, trying to work that one out. <clears throat> but for me, it's been a, a, a monstrously difficult challenge because uh, the challenge when you're looking at something like the Don Bennett collection is to try to work out each piece, what's important about it, and then the relative importance of one piece to another. Now, his collection is not massive by some standards. It shows that, in fact, he did go through it at some stage and he... Uh, and he reduced it somewhat, probably because Lee was at him for a considerable period of time about the messy state of his office at uh, Deepwood House, of which I have photographs. So I must assume that he deliberately kept every item in it because it had some importance to him. Now, so the importance of some of those items is immediately recognisable. So I can look at certain wartime papers. There is, for instance, in the collection, the telegram that he received from Arthur Harris on the day that uh, peace was declared uh, and it was sent through to him as a personal thank you for his contribution to Bomber Command during the war. But uh, at other times I'm picking up pieces of paper which are quite simply baffling. I have no idea what a piece of paper is. I don't know where it fits. I don't know why he kept it. <clears throat> and it's not helped by Don Bennett being a scribbler uh, he, was, he was quite an impulsive man and he was constantly thinking. So he would grab a piece of paper, whatever was to hand, and he would write on it. It might be a piece of paper he'd ripped in half or it might be a drinks coaster or it might be the back of an envelope. He was good with backs of envelopes. And then his handwriting doesn't help. He writes in pencil. He's got his trusty pencil and it's in his pocket and he pulls it out and he just writes. And then Perhaps surprisingly, he wasn't particularly organised with his paperwork, which means there's pieces of paper everywhere. And so I have got this monster-sized historical jigsaw puzzle where I'm trying to work out what all the bits are, what's important and how they all fit together. And so I've adopted this process that as I research each stage of his life, and I've made it to 1940, and I've written to 1940, 
is to go through the collection of documents, many of which I've digitized again and again and again, looking for links and clues. And this has led to some absolutely outstanding discoveries. And I'm just going to offer four quick ones for you tonight. There was in the first pass, in the first couple of months that I was there, a little envelope around about this big, and I opened it up and I pulled it out and it was, it was quite it had obviously been opened many times and it, the folds were, were quite worn, etc. And I looked at it and it had lists and all sorts of bits and pieces, but and I had no idea what this was. I scanned it, I put it back in the envelope and I just put it in the drawer. And then in the middle, one night, I, I woke up with this aha experience and I went back and I checked and sure enough, some of it was written in Swedish. And this was the one piece of paper he wrote on in Sweden after the famous raid to bomb the Tirpitz in Norway on the 27th of April 1942, when he was shot down and he escaped over the border to Sweden. Uh, to Sweden. And then within a month, he was back in England. And a month after that, he was appointed as the AOC of the Pathfinder Force. And it was this particular raid for which he was given the DSO. And it appears to me from, from looking at the collection so far, it is the only memento from this key event in his life. And yet at first look glance, and when I, when I scanned it, it had absolutely no meaning at all. And it was just tucked in somewhere. And, and even the envelope had nothing written on it. He knew what it was, but the historian wandering in afterwards had no idea for some time. Secondly is, uh, early on, I also scanned a telegram, which was sent to him from the Air Ministry in December 1940, while he was working for Atlantic Ferry in Canada. And it summonsing, summonses him to a meeting at the Air Ministry in England the next time he's flying one of the Hudsons over and he's, uh, he's in England. <clears throat> and it's, it's partially written in a sort of a code, but there's also just lots of letters and numbers just to keep the whole thing desperately short. And for a long time, I looked at that and I had nowhere, no way of understanding what it was. So it was dated December 40. So I just stuck it in December 40 and thought one day I will come back to that and it'll make sense. And after recent research, I was able to decipher it. And it was sent by Group Captain Albert Lang following meeting that he had had, Lang had had, with the new Deputy Chief of the Air Staff, who at that time was none other than Arthur Harris. And those two, Lang and Bennett, were, uh, Lang and Harris were Bennett's uh, senior officers at 210 Squadron back in 1933 when he was flying flying boats. And now at the end of 1940, those two have got together at the Air Ministry, have been talking about Bennett, and they are asking him to come and see them when he's next uh, in England. Eight months later, he's back in the RAF as a wing commander. And so this innocuous telegram, again, just stuck somewhere in the papers, no particular order or anything, indecipherable for a long period of time. And then the research brings out, and then all of a sudden, there is this telegram which now appears to be a key turning point in his life. I have the handwritten notes that he made, including on the back of envelopes, uh, for the writing of his controversial memoirs in 1958. And I asked myself, why did he keep those notes? Why would, after you've written your memoirs and they're all published and out there, wouldn't you just grab your notes and throw them in a bin? So what I did was I, I thought he's kept them because they're important. And I was drawn to them because they show his original thinking about what he regarded as important when he came to write the story of his life. And it's interesting, they include questions that he felt he needed answers to, various bits that, that he couldn't quite remember from the war years, uh, potential chapter titles, which are themselves interesting, <coughs> commentary on various people, including people he didn't particularly like, uh, and uh, chap of whom there were quite a few, uh, chapter outlines, etc. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I know he would have done that. He's, he was a bit of a scathing sort of personality. Well, he, 
yes, it, it, and he probably had good reasons for certain things, but we won't we won't talk about those at this stage. But um, uh, finally, and probably very significantly, as far as I'm concerned, something that certainly attracted Richard Clarkson's attention is Bennett, as one of the foremost early navigators, had a thing for maps. He just loved maps and QAM has his original map desk. And so far I have documented from that map desk, from under the map desk, in filing cabinet, et cetera, over 700 maps. He just loved maps. If he saw maps that he liked, he would buy them, including maps back into the, well into the 1800s. And the question that I've had is which of those maps are important to him to reflect various parts of his life and which of those maps are just maps that he liked collecting because they're maps. Um, and I was recently writing about the world seaplane record where he flew from Dundee to Orange River in, um, in South Africa in 1938. And I went back to the maps to see if I could find the maps related to that particular sea, uh, world record flight. And sure enough, all the maps for all the countries from all the way through are there, including the line that he followed, the constant course that he had mapped out. So I quickly located all those maps. But then when I got to the story of the, the detail of the story itself and finding that halfway through the flight during the second day, uh, he ran into some very significant difficulties. And uh, he, was having, he was thinking that they might not make it through the night. And he was hoping to make it to morning. And if he made it to morning, he was going to have to look to land on water somewhere uh, on the west coast of Africa. So I went back to the maps for a second time. And sure enough, these maps had marks on them for various spots down the west coast of Africa that I would, they, they were not related to the actual maps for the, for, the, for the flight itself. But these were additional maps that he carried in the event of such a crisis like this. And so I was actually able to work out what particular places he was looking to land at and why he looked at some seriously and not others. So why is any of this important? And I just want to finish with a couple of points. The first is I've got to assume that everything Bennett kept was of importance to him. I can't dismiss a scrap of paper or a note or a drinks coaster without considering carefully how it might be important to the broader story. And secondly, I'm discovering that it's the little things, it's not the big ticket items, it's the little things that most help build the true picture of the person. In Don's case, the paper that he wrote on, the scraps, the envelopes, the notebooks, the drawings that he did, he could draw beautifully, um, diagrams of aircraft, the maps, what he wrote on maps, the drafts of letters and, uh, and drafts of books, all the little things all come together to build a picture. And I'm not going to be able to decipher every piece of paper that's in the collection. But the more I keep going over these pieces of paper, the more the patterns emerge about this person, Don Bennett, and those themselves help me decipher other pieces of paper. So a plea. If you want to leave traces of your life for others to work over when you are gone, will you please do them a favour and one, arrange them in order and then two, label each item with this was important to me because. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. That was great. Really interesting. Thanks, Ian. Um, and I just remembered that Ian is our other guest speaker that I engaged recently for our meeting on the 26th of May, where he's going to talk about the aircraft flown by Air Vice Marshal Don Bennett between 1930 and 1941. So we've got speakers right up to, um, to May. Thanks again, Ian. Pleasure. Um, our next speaker is Mary Van Hummel. Here we go, over to you, Mary. Yes, uh, first of all, after hearing talk, I just want to quickly say how I came to be here. My father-in-law, uh, Everett Van Hummel, uh, was a, in the, with KLM and was in the Second World War. Uh, I sat with him one day and got a story from him, which I wrote on one page. 
then what happened is after his passing at the age of 100, uh, I was, after joining the Aviation Historical Society, uh, I asked for anything that he had that I could uh, get hold of. Saskia, his daughter, saved everything for me, gave it to me, but it was mostly in Dutch. So huh. I spoke to Peter, and Peter <laughs> got me on to Paul. And through Paul, um, I was able to get all the information. So between Peter, Paul, and Mary, we had a, <laughs> we had a good go. And I ha was having trouble with my computer, but Peter said, don't think twice, it's all right. Uh -huh. <laughs> if you can get that one. So I'm starting. <laughs> Evert van Hummel was born in Barn in the Netherlands on the 29th of January, 1916. Evert van Hummel, some called him Evert, others called him Herman, uh, started working at the Air Force Base Stosterberg, age 15, in the engineering shop. He became ground engineer and went to Bandung, Netherlands, East Indies, known as Indonesia. And he worked for the Dutch East Indies Air Force called Ponten. Just before Netherlands East Indies capitulated to the Japanese, Ibrit uh, left Java on March 7, 1942 at the, as a flight engineer on the very last plane to leave Indonesia arriving in Australia. This plane was a DC-3 named the Vilava. The aircraft had left Calcutta on the 14th of February, 1942 at Akyap and Medan. In Medan, aircraft seats were removed to accommodate a group of 36 women and children who were evacuated to Batavia. The aircraft arrived in Batavia on the 15th of February, 1942, the day that Singapore surrendered. On March 30, on March 3rd, 1942, Captain Eddie Dunlop landed the aircraft on Boab Bateau Road, an unfinished highway near Bendion, to evacuate His Excellency the Lieutenant Governor General D.H. Van Mook to Australia. Several Clem ground staff were also evacuated. The aircraft took off from Beitobo Road on March 7th at 1 uh, a.m. It was the last civil aircraft to escape the East Indies. There was a Japanese action uh, occurring at Lim Limbang, less than 15 kilometers away from Bandiong, where they left the area. The PKALW arrived at Port Headland in Western Australia, seven hours and 32 minutes later. Later when flying between Adelaide and Perth, they landed in Calgary in Western Australia and headed to the pub only with only Indonesian coins in their pockets. The publican said, not to worry, don't think twice, it's all right. The <laughs> money <laughs> as the drinks were on him. After all, they were helping protect Australia. Everett spent the rest of the war flying Catalinas uh, with the 321st Dutch Squadron, RAF, under British Allied Command. The squadron was formed on the 15th of August, 1942 in Ceylon or Sri Lanka uh, from the personnel of the Royal Netherlands Naval Air Service who had been able to flee to Ceylon after Japanese invasion of Indonesia. The squadron was equipped with Catalinas. From the Ceylon, the Catalinas were also flown to Australia, mainly for transport of equipment and personnel. The planes established several world records of these long distance flights. On average, 15 of the 22 aircraft of this squadron were available for war. And with this small fleet, they convoyed no less than 6,000 Allied ships without any loss to personnel or planes. After the war, they flew between Indonesia, Ceylon, Australia to repatriate um, Indonesian personnel from the islands to Australia. 
On October 23rd, the Catalina with Avert Van uh, flight engineer went to Mokmar on the island of Bake, off the coast of the Dutch New Guinea to deliver a few crates of alcohol for the troops of the RAF Netherlands uh, 120 squadron. But unfortunately, they flew too low to land safely and crashed into the ocean. As the engineer's position was on the top of the plane, Everett was able to climb over and drag the pilot out of the cockpit. He later went back to retrieve the very precious crates of booze to help him get over this trauma of the crash landing. <laughs> The report of the Catalina crash was in the magazine uh, of the 120 squadron. Catalina Y-62 approaches the south coast of Beck on the afternoon, familiar territory. For nearly a year, Alta crews have been operating with the cats from Rose Bay, Sydney at posts and bases in the liberated areas of New Guinea, mostly for resupply or flying uh, NICA personnel. For boat commander De Groot and his crew, including later KLM flight engineer Avert Van Hummel, the flight is also a routine matter. They approached the coast with the terrace inland in Hinterland for the second time within a few days, this time after an external service to Wundi and Hollandia. At Mokomer, the rival of the Catalina does not go unnoticed. Several people from 120 Squadron see the flying boat descend to the sea surface, pull up and turn around for the another landing attempt. At that point, no one expects them to witness the final landing of the Y-62, slightly sloping backwards. The cat sinks to the water for the second time why it goes wrong, they cannot see. But just before the hell was to make contact with the sea surface, the left auxiliary driver hits the water and the flying boat makes a sudden turn counterclockwise. At the same time, De Groot slides throttles of the engines to full power in a reaction, a reaction that leads to catastrophic consequences because both Pratt and Whitney's are ripped from their mounting bolts. A plug mows through the cabin skin right behind the pilots. The briefly loosened Catalina croaks in the water again and strands on a reef where the bottom sprang leaks. Alarmed, Americans with uh, speedboats are quick on the spot. The crew members turn out to be miraculously unharmed. They together with a crate of 24 bottles of whiskey and one with 24 bottles of sherry intended for distribution at Beck are brought ashore in triumph. Yay! <laughs> Here, a reception committee of the 120 squadron is already waiting. Among the guards are Brooke Pins and fighter pilot Hope Stra. Maybe someone else knows how to pronounce that who will later go to KLM. Source of this uh, is a magazine, Quantum Certificate 1944, to be more than 24 hours continuous in the air. So they had um, achieved a few records. Quantum Certificate 1945 on Flying Indian Ocean Kangaroo Service, first official KLM flight to Australia, Sydney, in 1951. Uh, you can go on to the next slide, I think. Those were the certificates. There, that one. Um, Abert is in the middle of the picture. Herman married his first wife, Honor, in Sydney. Uh, she was actually a, a model. They had a son, Peter, who was born on April 4th, 1944. After the liberation, Ever went back to Indonesia and then on to Netherlands, but he returned to Sydney to meet his son Peter, for the who was by then two and a half years after his birth. Okay, the marriage 
didn't work out. So he decided to go back to Netherlands where he started flying for KLM. After his early retirement with a golden handshake, at the age of 48, he came back to Australia with his new family in 1964. After finding out they changed their retirement age back to 55. He made the decision to uproot the family again and went back to the Netherlands where he continued to fly first for Schreiner Airways and later for Transavia and fully retired at 55. In 1987, he migrated again to Australia with his wife, Frederica Freddy, to make Australia his definite home. The last page of Everett's logbook, his last flight in 1970, total number of flying hours from his flying career after the war was over 22,000 hours. Pictures below of Everett and his, um, Everett and his family, sons, Robert O'Yam. That one is of uh, Herman and Peter uh, Van Hummel. In the year 2000, he visited a friend in Calandra. Calandra? Calandra. Calandra. <sighs> Who took him to Queensland Air Museum. And to his surprise, he saw the Bielefa really, really fully restored and on display. So Herman was reunited with his old plane both had survived many an adventure. Herman celebrated his 100th birthday on the 29th of Jan January 2016, where he received a birthday cake with a KLM plane on it. KLM <laughs> sent him a model of, of the then latest KLM aircraft with his name printed on the front. Herman passed away on the 30th of April 2016 in Mermaid Beach. I was fortunate to have known this always welcoming gentleman and his lovely wife, Freddie, who had a ready smile, a twinkle in his eyes and a good sense of humor. Thanks to Peter Dunn for all the help in putting me in touch with Paul. And from that, you can find full history on the DAC website, which is the Australian Cultural Center, or just Google um, Alfred Herman Van Hummel, and you'll see a lot of the story there. Uh, thank you again to all the family and friends that helped uh, give me the information to add to their museum. Thank you. Thanks, all Mary. Then. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> just just, just a, an extra comment. Uh, that, that's the aircraft that's on display at Calandra. Um, one of the slides we didn't dwell on was this one. That's the same aircraft during World War II. VHCXE, uh, sexy. Um, it was in MacArthur's private fleet. It was one of his first um, private aircraft that he had in his own personal fleet of aircraft. So that's the one that's at um, Calandra Air Museum. Um, any questions for Mary? Uh, not a quick, I can add another little bit about the DC-3. Uh, I had a 50% ownership of that aeroplane and persuaded the other 50% to donate it to the QAM. It was at that time in Camden. Ah, very I interesting. Think, I think that might have been the one that was flown under the Sydney Harbour Bridge by the Dutchmen who were protesting uh, MacArthur wanting to commandeer it. Yeah, I think you're right. More, more than likely. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I think you're right. It's quite a few aircraft flew under that bridge. <laughs> and while yeah. I came to have a picture of that aeroplane, I've flown in as a passenger from Foster to see when I was a kid. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Interesting right. that you had a 50% ownership, Bob. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't it's know that. Very did. World. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the times on that uh, talk I did was March 7th, who happens to be my birthday. So there are all sorts of Coincidences. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Mary. So You're welcome. Next, next speaker is Bob Livingston. So over to you, Bob. I'll go to the first slide. Okay. <laughs> uh, this little story happened it's a time 31 years ago. Uh, the aircraft that you can see there is November 5 6 Lima Hotel. It was discovered. Uh, in a farmyard being used as a chicken coop. 
and restored to that sort of condition. Uh, all this little work here, that's all hand done, all that sort of the way they've done all that. Usually, you often see it on instrument panels, but that the whole aircraft's been done like that. You're talking about the polish yeah. job, the polish job thing. Yeah, but you see, yeah, these are little, all these are little overlapping circles. Little Some circles of them. On, the, on the aluminium. Machine yeah. turning. Yeah, with a hand drill arrangement, you know. Um, anyway, this, this aircraft then subsequently was sold. Uh, and it went to a flying museum in the US. And if you'd like to move on to the next slide, please, Peter. It was finished in USAF, inverted commas, markings. Being quite as, I think it was quite as brown as that. It should have been a bit more green. Anyway, it was purchased by some Australians. And that's it arriving uh, from its uh, trans-Pacific flight at uh, Bankstown, where I worked in the control tower. I obviously, I was, I was the boss by that stage, so I could shoot out there and take photographs whenever I felt like it. I didn't have to worry about uh, asking permission. I was the permission. Uh, and. I was always in a bit of an adventure, aviation-wise. I like to, to take some adventurous flights. I only ever knocked back one flight, and that was in a MiG-15. That's the one that subsequently crashed in Canberra. I just didn't trust that aeroplane. The decision was taken by these owners to uh, take it to the Easter show in New Zealand. And uh, they decided that they could get some people to, uh, to come along. That's another angle of it. Uh, because it had been a chicken uh, uh, coop at some stage, they painted, flew the coop on it. The only thing was that wasn't painted until it got back from New Zealand. We went over there completely, completely bare, uh -huh. which is a little unfortunate. But anyway, its its future was to be New Zealand. Uh, I got an opportunity to do some air to air work, flying in the back of a T six, and that's just one of the photographs that that I took. So they decided we would uh, fill this aeroplane up with uh, interested parties. And there's pilot, co-pilot, who just did it because he, he wanted some time in the aeroplane. And that's the pilot's wife, one of the part owners, myself there. This was just before we departed. We flew from Bankstown to... Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Peter. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting that. I was going to ask. <laughs> I, yeah, look at that. I, I, all my hair was brown in those days. <laughs> I knew about that. Yeah. Um, we flew it to Brisbane because we had to do customs. And the next slide shows us parked at a wet Brisbane outside the, term, the Qantas areas at the cargo flights. And we did our customs clearance there. Uh, we had our first little difficulty with the aeroplane at that point in time. Uh, the number two engine kept leaking oil and it leaked oil onto the, the tarmac. And I think it was one of the, the, the push rods up here. And that's the pilot who was a test pilot and an engineer and a Qantas skipper as well. So a pretty experienced chappy, thank goodness. And uh, so it did up a few nuts and I remember some uh, Qantas people wandered over and looked it up and down and wondered about it. And, and they <laughs> said, you know, what's, what's the story? And I said, oh, you know, we 
just a little bit of a problem here. We're going to take it across to New Zealand. And they said, you're mad. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out they were almost right. Um, so we went, left Brisbane and went via Norfolk. I'd never been to Norfolk, so that was an interesting experience. Uh, that's uh, the, the runway in, uh, in in Norfolk. This was on departure. We had a, a, an overnight. By the time we got to, to Norfolk, it was uh, dark. And I, for the first time in my life, experienced what it was like to fly over the ocean at, I think we were at about 8,000 at the time, with all the cloud shadows looking for an island and thinking about all those people who flew all those uh, Trans-Pacific and any, any long over water flights looking for little bits of land with all this all these little cloud shadows everywhere. Thank goodness we had an ADF, which we could tune in so we knew where we were. Uh, I was just passengering down the back. Uh, we landed there and went to a hotel and for a departure the next morning, and this was taken on the departure as we turned crosswind. I just took a quick snap. And we flew right around the island, had a good look at it. Uh, I had uh, a bit of a heavy head. We enjoyed ourselves quite a bit. And I was snoozing in my seat towards the aft end of the aeroplane on the, uh, on the uh, port side of the aircraft. And I was rudely awoken by a loud bang. And I you know, didn't know what was going, jumped up and down a bit. Uh, the, uh, and it, it, nothing else happened after that. It seemed to be going okay. And then I settled back and relaxed and started to doze off again. There was another bang. Well, these bangs continued uh, getting closer and closer and closer together. And I went forward to this window here and I happened to be looking right at that position that you can see there now when another one went bang and that cowling actually expanded. And I thought, shit, I hope it doesn't come off because it would have gone straight through the tailplane and that would have been the end of us. Anyway, the aircraft then, the, the engine itself then started to surge. So we were uh, flying along and the engine would start to die and that would cause the drag, of course. So we would pull to the right and then it would burst into life and we'd swing the other way. So we were madly swinging left and right as we went along. And then suddenly the engine just stopped dead, pack. And the pilot luckily got us feathered because that, and that's, I took that photograph of the, uh, the feathered prop and I was just slightly concerned about this. So by this stage, I, I, I'd sort of gone, I was right up in the, just to the rear of the cockpit talking to the pilots at that stage. Nobody else on board the aircraft had any flying experience or aviation experience of any particular type. And uh, we were unable to maintain height. We were at 10,000 <laughs> and we were just slowly but surely going down. And when I looked in the cockpit, I thought, oh, the control columns, the, the, the spectacles, were turned almost completely vertically to the left. There was almost no aileron control left to hold the right wing up if we had any further problems. We were almost full aileron deflection at that stage and the aircraft was descending and descending and descending. Anyway, as we got down into thicker air, but we got down to about 1,500 feet and, and we were able to maintain altitude from there. Uh, while the two pilots were flying the aeroplane, I took the radio, being an air traffic controller, I had all the, the, the right phrasings and things, and I called uh, New Zealand Flight Service. This, I might add, happened about five minutes past PNR between Norfolk and New Zealand, <clears throat> point of no return. So we had to continue. Uh, it was, luckily it was a sensible decision anyway, because 
you really didn't want to be left at uh, in Norfolk Island with a busted aeroplane. At least in New Zealand, you could do something about it. But we had to uh, we had to change course. We had to find the nearest part of New Zealand. So I asked flight service what it, where it was, and they gave us uh, a, a, an airport in the very very north of New Zealand, which the name uh, Kaitaia. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. ex, ex World War Two Air Force Base. But of course, no customers there. So that was going to cause a, a further problem to us. Uh, but so we got a lot, lot closer to the airfield. And when we crossed the coast, I told flight service we'd crossed the coast and they sort of said, oh, and I repeated you know, we've crossed the coast so they didn't seem to think very much of that and I but I did because I knew we weren't going to have to ditch at that point we might have to crash land but we weren't going to ditch uh it was about this point that the penny dropped with the pilot when the cockpit had a bit of paint refurbishing the placards for some of the controls were reversed. And so what was supposed to be trim for uh, the ailerons was actually for elevators and all these oh, sorts of things, which is, what, which is why we were cross-controlled the whole time. So when the penny dropped, it realised what it had done, retrimmed the aeroplane, that was fly and it flew much better, and which was good because landing... So we, we landed at Kaitaia, met by all the fire services and, and ambulances that you could possibly think of. Oh, there they are. I took that through the cockpit window and we were just about to take the taxiway left. The only thing was you couldn't go left. We had to go right in a circle and then, then down that taxiway. <laughs> so we were stuck in Kaitaia waiting on Easter Friday or Easter Saturday, when everybody was uh, coming out of uh, out of Auckland and driving away for the Easter break, and it took the customs people for absolutely hours, and they locked us in a shed uh, until we could be customs cleared. Uh, that was a photograph taken by the Northland Age photographer, which I managed to get a copy of, and that was us. Uh, just after, just in the process of landing, as you can see. Oh, uh, yes, we we came. Yes, that's me again when I was a lot younger. And this chap here, it was a very laid back, easygoing sort of fella. And while all this agony was going on in the aeroplane about what we were going to do and whether we were going to ditch and all the rest of it, I and one of the, that other fat, in fact, it's that chappy there, one of the part owners of the aeroplane. I've now, you know, you read about people going green with fear. He was a pale apple green <laughs> in the face. And that's the only time I've ever seen it. This chap, he was reading a book. And when we got down, I said to him, what the hell were you doing just sitting there reading a book? He said, if I was going to die, I wanted to know how the story finished. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty laid back, I thought. Uh, to, to wrap the story up, uh, what had happened was the, uh, the these engines had a, a rear uh, drive on them that drove the... Uh, uh, Magnetos, oil pump, fuel pump, the whole works. And it dropped a tooth. And that's what the backfiring was because the timing started to go out because, and it got worse and worse and worse until one another tooth dropped out and jammed it and then just sheared it. And so the whole thing stopped because we had no spark, we had no fuel, we had nothing. <clears throat> that's why it stopped in such a big hurry. So that aeroplane did not get fixed for a long, long time. We went to the air show courtesy of a Cherokee and a Cessna 402. I was in the 402 when we went down to, uh, to, to Auckland. 
the people in the Cherokee, this is in the dark, and all you could see on the ground was a great big long line of red tail lights as all these New Zealanders were going away to the country for their Easter holidays. Uh, it had engine failure, engine problems, and it was farting, barking, and carrying on like nobody's business, but it finally got them there. And then we had to catch a cab to the hotel that we had been going to all the time called the White House. Uh, the, the owner of which was a part owner of that New Zealand Mustang. And when he discovered what our story was, everything was free. Free beer, free, free steaks, the whole works. So we were mightily well looked after, but mind you, they poured shit on us. And we just had to wear it, of course, <laughs> for what was going on. And so we got to the, to the air show. We uh, reduced the number of people. Some of them stayed in Auckland. They didn't really feel like flying anymore. Uh, they went down in, in the 402, and then we came back after the show was over. And uh, when I wrote the story for one of the magazines, I, I said, you know, whenever you go away, a bit like the Air Force, you always want to take your toothbrush with you and your, and your um, credit card these days. I had to buy a ticket on... A, Qantas 767 with, to go to from Auckland back to Sydney, and it co cost more money to do that, that than you could get than you could pay Qantas for a uh, return flight uh, for a week's holiday. In a, you know, if you when you were paying in advance, but you just walk into the terminal and say, "I want a flight. I want a ticket in that. I want a seat on that flight." So it was an expensive exercise, a little bit like the previous one where we'd gone to Tahiti to bring a, 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 a Neptune home from Tahiti, only we couldn't quite get it fixed in time. And so again, we had to pay exorbitant amounts of money to, uh, to fly back home again by courtesy of uh, uh, the uh, UTA flying uh, DC-10s at the time. And that's the story of the one-engined Lodestar, which uh, eventually got a new engine flown from the US because they were new engines at the time for the ferry flight. Uh, it was then purchased by a New Zealander, flown back to New Zealand. New Zealand wouldn't give it a C of A and it's never flown since. Mm. Okay. And that's the story. Thanks, Bob. Any quick questions? For Bob? Yeah, were they right cyclones or Pratt Whitney's? Uh, they're rights. Yes. Not, not Mr. Pratt, Pratt and Whitney dependable engines. No, not at <laughs> <laughs> sure. Is it still in New Zealand, uh, Bob? Yes. Still there, eh? Uh, I'm not certain of its location. Yeah. Museum. Now, it's, it's moved. It, it, it was outside for a long, long time, so I have no idea what sort of condition it's in now. Because okay. New Zealand it, NAC used lodestars themselves, so why New Zealand didn't but wouldn't uh, put a CLA on the aeroplane, I do not know. Might be a chicken coop again. <laughs> Quite possible. <prosper. laughs> Righto, thanks, Bob. Uh, next speaker is Warwick, who's going to talk about no brakes, no steering in a dove. Right, we should have a dove picture. Let's take it at uh, well, our North Territory, northwest of Alice Springs. It was unusual to see two doves out in the bush together, and I was there talking to some people, and the other dove came in the circuit. I said, so he ran, I bolted to the airplane, jumped inside, came back with a camera, and just got that picture. I could see it coming. Now, it's beside the point of this story. This little story in 1972 when I was there at uh, Alice Springs on my aerial medical service stint. And uh, this is a Havilland Dove cockpit, obviously, and it looks like a brand new one at the time, too. Mm -hmm. I just want to show you a few things in it. Over there's the pneumatic pressure gauge. The undercarriage flaps and brakes are operated by pneumatic systems. And the brakes are operated by that lever with your thumb. You press it in and the brake goes down. If your rudders are central, even brake pressure will go to both, or air pressure will go to the brakes in both main wheels. If you've got the right rudder pedal forward, you get brake on the right side, and that makes you turn to the right. Then the magneto switches, left engine, right engine, and a little bar across the top there. If you put that down, it turns all four off altogether. 
So when you say union down, you just put that down as well because we confirms that they're all turned off. I won't bother going into all the details of the dove cockpit, which is all I could do. Don't want to waste too much time there. Okay, we're based out of springs and we're going to go for flying a flight uh, down first to the next. Now springs and next to Ayers Rock, which is at the top of that little slant there. That's the actual Uluru the Rock. And it was called the Cool Ayers Rock in those days anyway. And from there, we went on down to Armada, that's the plan. Went to Ayers Rock, uh, did the whatever medical service we were doing there, putting somebody up or seeing somebody, and then flying down to Armata for a routine medical visit. Um, there's a village down the bottom left there. That's, pretty, that's a recent photograph from Google Earth. And it was probably only about a third that size in those days. And at the top right there, you'll see the airstrip for Armata. However, coming in towards the circuit and the flyover Armata to let them know we've arrived, and all the aerodrome, there pre landing checks, and among the pre landing checks, we would just press the brake handle and see the lead. Uh, just you know, you, uh, the brakes gauges just flick as you've got it open, and uh, various other pre landing checks. However, in this case, as I touched that button, that little lever, it just flopped around, it wasn't connected to anything next. So Obviously, it's not a good idea to go and land at Armata with no brakes. And because your steering is done by differential braking, no steering either on the ground. So I just called on HF to Alice Springs, got a hotel, got a amended flight plan, not landing at Armata now, we're going to go to Alice Springs. We gave them an ETA, etc., and uh, set on the way. It's about an hour and a half flight. And get about halfway along when I get within VHF range. And uh, then I called on flight service on VHF, <clears throat> on VHF rather than talking on HF to a third of Australia, told them why we were returning, that we would have no brakes and no steering when I arrived. And uh, got the ETA, et cetera. And they uh, okay, took that on board and then they pretty quickly came back to, uh, can you hold for half an hour before we land? <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Enough to feel no problem. Uh, because we have to wait until after the 227s have arrived and departed. So we came and just held a little while at northwest of Alice Springs, and that's where we're going to land. As a by the way, the top left, you, know, you can see what would have been the runway and three runways in World War II. Uh, that's the runway, 8,000 feet approximately. And uh, this run runway 1 2 is the most commonly used runway there. The winds in general tend to be from the southeast. Uh, so I came in, uh, before we got there, I briefed my passengers. I think we we're about half full, it's an eight or nine seater. And I got them all stuck in the back seats. I wanted to get my centre gravity as far aft as I could. I briefed the uh, doctor who was up board there and uh, said what was going to happen. I said, well, probably no problem when we land. But just in case we do end off up off the runway in, in a ditch, before you jump out, come make sure I'm all right if I make sure I haven't banged my head on the cockpit or something. We came around and I touched down just right on the beginning of the runway instead of in the touchdown zone. Touched down right at the piano keys. As soon as the main wheels are on the ground, I flick that lever down to turn all the magnet, both all the magnets, both engines off, because I didn't want any more forward thrust, did I? and touched down and held my nose up as long as I possibly could until I ran out of elevator authority with less airflow on it. Nose came down and we were decelerating the reasonable rate with the drag of the aircraft. But once the nose came down, much less drag and we were rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling and finally stopped there about 5,000 feet down the runway and we did stop on the ditch and so there was no drama there. And we had to sit in the airplane for a little while, not, not a long time, but the ground engineer came out with the Land Rover, which we used as a tug, and the tow bar, and put the tow bar on the nose wheel and towed us back in. And so that was just a little incident. It all ended well. And that's the end. Thank you. Any uh, questions for uh, Warwick? Any questions, yes. Warwick, Ooh. I see that the Dove had boost pressure. I mean, it's just a different way of measuring manifold pressure that's what, right was, yeah. what was takeoff boost yeah. cruise boost plus seven inches that's a yeah. seven seven 
seven psi, man. Mm. Uh, plus seven, uh, and cruise power is about plus one boost. We call it boost. Yeah. And this is organised by your throttle. And the Americans, the plus seven in, uh, pounds uh, boost was approximately equal to 45 inches manifold pressure in American terminology. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty high. That's a high, high it's a, manifold it's a, it's pressure. Mm. Supercharged engines. And uh, the, the Gypsy Queen 70 Mark II has put out 380 horsepower each. A straight Gypsy engine, Gypsy Queen engine without supercharging with only about 250 horsepower. That's what the Conair Doves had. Uh, Herons, kind of Herons had four Gypsy Queens, but these are Gypsy Queen 70 Mark IIs with pressure, uh, the uh, high, high pressure. Any other questions? Who sat in the right seat? Uh, there was nobody in the right seat. It's a very uh, crowded cockpit for two people. Oh, yeah, there's a had the duck egg getting in. Once you're sitting in the seat of the room, but uh, yeah, it's a bit squeezy getting into it. But once you're in, tons of room. Uh, frequently on uh, evacuation flights, on the you go to get something from out in the bush, and a nurse would always go with you in that case, and they'd usually sit next to you. But uh, about eight seater altogether. That one had uh, nine seaters, and then we also had the ability, a capability of picking the seat out of the clip and putting it in the boot. And putting a stretcher up, we had following stretches in the boot. We could put up two stretches if we needed to. More questions? Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed my two years flying at Arthur Alice Springs, and uh, that was I would have had seven years on the friendships. I only had five years on the friendships as a first officer. And this is another a couple of years in command, multi, multi years in command, which is what you always wanted to get multi years in command. Beautiful airplane, the dove. Very nice to land, has to stand nicely every time. Very big flap, and uh, they got a 60 degrees flap, and you can see it on the one flying past. So that's what I wanted to use to stop me uh, on the roll and use up the bag as much as I could. Anyway, no okay. questions. Oh. It's just a remarkably long roll, even so. That's... It's, yeah, about 5,000 feet, and that was <laughs> a very light headwind. Uh, while I had speed, then the rudder was effective, but of course, once I slowed down, the rudder wasn't effective anyway. Yeah. But uh, we were on the mission, a little bit off, so not very far off. So. And you kept on centre line with no uh, problem with steering otherwise? or? Well, I had no steering. Yeah. I had no brakes. All I had was the rudder aerodynamically. Once I slowed down, that wasn't much good. And it just rolled and rolled and rolled, and thank goodness it didn't go yeah. off the mission. So it, it stayed pretty close to centre line. At that yeah, time. yeah. It would have been difficult if it had been a crosswind. Oh, yeah. Bad then it would have been. Mm. Yeah, you would have been off the fingers. <laughs> uh, I guess. No, I don't care. Who's to know? Um, if it had been a strong crosswind, I might have had to elect to land on the other run runway. Which you saw briefly in that picture there on the left side of the picture. Any thought of keeping the en engines running for control, left, right? No, I didn't want any thrust. I wanted to cut oh. the engines as soon as the wheels on the ground. <laughs> I wanted to get rid of all thrust. I just needed to stop it. Never. Yes, I could. Have, if I had the engine going, I could turn my engine power a little bit, but I wasn't going to stop that way. That's right, I wasn't going to stop you. <laughs> no, that was the first thing I did. Cut that all four magnetos as soon as the main wheels touched the ground and held the nose up as long as I could to get the maximum drag, aerodynamic drag. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, that's it for tonight. Uh, that's the end of the uh, members chat part of the um, meeting tonight. Thank you, everyone, for participating, and thank you to all the speakers.